In construction, there's a fair amount of attention that's given to the transfer of risk from one party to the other. Oftentimes, we tend to think that construction risk is simply about materials and methods. Maybe we think about the installation of bricks, lumber, concrete, or lots of other different materials that go into the production of a building. But a lot of the risk that gets transferred in construction is contractual and is more of a function of money or cash flow or things on a much larger scale that happen associated with a project. And one of the most common transfers of risk is when the owner of a project seeks to transfer the risk of construction to a general contractor. And within all this transfer of risk, there are things that parties do to mitigate that risk. Many times this takes the form of either a bond or through insurance. Bonds and insurance in many ways are similar with things that are common between them. On the other hand, there are things fundamentally that are very different. So collectively, maybe then a way to look at this is that bonds and insurance are somewhat similar in many ways. The most common way that they're similar is that they're both forms of assurance. In other words, bonds and insurance are both ways for one party to mitigate risk in favor of another. Typically, the reason that another party would be willing to accept the risk that's associated by the transfer of obligation is because it would be in exchange for a fee, which is why for-profit companies are in business to begin with. Now, looking at some of the fundamental differences, first of all, let's talk about bonds. Bonds are functionally a three-party agreement, and the baseline proposition that happens is that there is some sort of relationship between a contractor and a surety. And by surety, I mean the entity that's going to consider providing a bond for the contractor. And there's a relationship here that has to be developed through what's called an indemnity agreement. What the indemnity agreement does is it establishes the relationship between the surety and the general contractor, and it says that the surety is willing to consider the underwriting of bonds for the general contractor in exchange for a premium. And then what the general contractor obligates is that if the surety has to pay on behalf of the contractor, then the general contractor agrees that he would repay that amount of money to the surety. Now, this sounds like there's not a lot of risk in the bonding business, but as we'll see, this is actually not the case. So as a three-party agreement, the third party that we're talking about is on a project basis, and that's the project owner. So in comes a general contractor that has a relationship with a surety by way of the indemnity agreement, and the contractor says that he would like to entertain going into contract with a project owner to build a particular project. And in that agreement, then the contractor agrees to provide a scope of work, that is to provide a building or some type of construction, in exchange for a fee. Well, there's a certain amount of risk that's associated with going into that arrangement. And many times, the owner says there are two fundamental types. One is that the contractor must perform the work satisfactorily. And second is that the contractor must make payments to material men, suppliers, and subcontractors, and so forth. And to mitigate that risk, many times the owner will require that the project be bonded. And that's where the surety becomes involved. If the project requires a bond, then based on the relationship between the contractor and the surety, the surety would agree to become obligated to the owner for the project as well. Basically what this means is that if the general contractor fails to either perform or pay, then the surety, as a second entity that's obligated, would then also be bound to the owner to both perform and pay for the completion of the project. And again, through the indemnity agreement, if the contractor did fail and the surety then had to make good on this obligation to perform and pay, then through the indemnity agreement, the contractor would agree to repay the surety. So again, this sounds like there's not much risk in the surety business. But the truth is, because the contractor very much needs the bonding capacity, in other words, this relationship for future work, and the contractor typically is not anxious for the surety to make payment on his behalf. In other words, he needs to solve the problem himself if he wants the ability to bond in the future. Now, fundamentally on the insurance side, this is a two-party arrangement, including one who would like to be insured against some type of risk, and then someone else, an insurer or sometimes called an underwriter, would agree to provide insurance coverage to the person who desires coverage, again, in exchange for a premium or fee. And this insurance could be for natural disaster or accidents or covering property and casualty and so forth. 
but it's a two-party arrangement defining some type of coverage and some type of limits that are established to a level that they desire or that's required by law. Now, another fundamental difference is that insurers go into this deal knowing that at some point in time they will have to pay. And they go in with that expectation knowing that accidents happen, there are weather events and other types of events, and that they will have to make payments sooner or later. On the other hand, the surety goes into a bonding proposition not planning to pay. And that's largely because the general contractor goes into that same deal not planning to fail. So that's a fundamental difference between these two forms of assurance. So let me repeat it. In this three-party agreement, the contractor does not plan to fail to provide the construction of the project. Therefore, the surety does not plan to have to pay. In the two-party arrangement, the insurer goes into this relationship with the understanding that at some point, some event will likely happen and then they will have to pay on their behalf. And just because the indemnity agreement says that the contractor would have to pay them back, the contractor needs future work so that by the time a project gets to be such that the surety actually has to make payment, then the contractor is in such poor shape that there's nothing liquid left for the surety to recoup through the indemnity agreement, which is the surety's greatest risk.